Now, in chapter 3, why we continue this tremendous teaching, the steps of the young man are steps now that are steps of responsibility. You see, he's left the home. He's moved out into a life today, out where the rubber meets the road, out where he's coming in contact with reality. Now, this is advice that's given to him. And his steps need to be ordered according to the Word of God. Oh, how important that is today. Now, that's the reason this jeweler over in Dallas years ago gave out the book of Proverbs by the thousands to young men. It's good advice, wonderful advice. Now, wisdom will be depicted to us as a woman here, but very easily we know today that wisdom it happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been made unto us wisdom, and we need him today. So the young man needs Christ. Now, here in chapter 3 again, it starts out, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Now, we're on Jewish ground here. We need to understand that. But it has a great importance and significance for us today. He says here, do you notice? Let thine heart keep my commandments. Isn't that an interesting statement? Now, this is just more than just submitting to duty. I hear so much of that, that it's our duty as a Christian. It's our duty to do this. Now, my friend, you won't like this, but it's not duty. (laughs) It's the loving devotion to the will of God. Remember what the psalmist said? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And you remember it was said of that young priest by the name of Ezra. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now, there needs to be today the preparation of the heart. The Lord Jesus had his own up there in the upper room. Remember how he talked to them so friendly, so intimately, so personally, and so wonderfully of things that had never been revealed before. And he said to these men, If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, may I say to you, he even goes, I think, even a little farther than that. He gets right down where we live. He says in John fourteen twenty three, If a man love me, he'll keep my saying. You love him? <laughs> then he wants to talk to you. Now, don't come to me about this matter of duty. It's your duty to do this. Somebody said to me some time ago, I feel that since you're on the radio, it's your duty to say this, my brother, will you forget the duty part of it? I love the Lord Jesus, and I really am trying to do what I think he wants me to do. He says for me to give out his word. He's sowing seed today. That's a picture of him, and I'm sowing seed under his direction. And I think that's the basis, my friend. That's the reason that sitting here in this studio and day after day making these tapes is wonderful. You know, if you love me, he says, if a man love me, he'll keep my say. And he said to Simon Peter, the fellow had denied him. My, how terrible it was. And you under to see a Galilee prepared breakfast for him. And I think Simon Peter avoided catching the eye of Jesus, finally did. And our Lord looked at him and said to him, what do you mean denying me? <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? What he said to him was, Simon, lovest thou me? If you love him, my friend, it makes life so much brighter, richer, and more wonderful. Listen to him now. Let not loving kindness and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and understanding in the sight of God and man. You see, loving kindness. Now, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth 
came by Jesus Christ. Loving kindness. What is loving kindness? It's grace. But it's like the little girl said. She was asked by the teacher, what's the difference between kindness and loving kindness? And she says, well, if you go in and ask your mama for a piece of bread with some butter on it, and she gives it to you, says, that's kindness. But if she puts a little jam on it without you asking her, that's loving kindness. God puts a little jam on it, friend. Loving kindness and truth. Just let not these forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. You'll find favor and understanding in the sight of God and man. How wonderful this is. And we need today to recognize that the Word of God should be given out like this. Now I'm going to come to two verses that are very familiar today. When verses are called for in a meeting, somebody's going to get up and give Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I'm sure I've heard them a thousand times in meetings where their verses are given. And I sometimes wonder if those who give them realize what a rich vein of truth they come out of. And they come out, remember, of this background of studying the Word of God. As Paul said to a young preacher, study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, having done that, and then knowing something about the loving kindness, the grace and truth of God, and holding on to those things. Now, he says, trust in Jehovah with all thy heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, let's take a look at that for just a moment. It's, I think, a very solemn admonition, and yet it has such wonderful assurance to be guided in a way of peace. And you know what a contrast this is. Later on, over in the 28th chapter, verse 26, he says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. A man was telling me the other day that he was witnessing to some of these that are in the drug culture, I guess. And he said to this young man, he says, God loves you, young man. And the young man says, I don't need God to love me. I love myself. I don't need to trust in God. I trust in myself. (laughs) Well, I wish this man had given him this verse. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But It's wonderful to trust in Jehovah with all your heart, totally committed to him. And this is something that's, I think, so definitely needed today is a total commitment to him. Trust in Jehovah with all thy heart. I find myself again and again when certain situations arise, or I'm even in an airport, and I find out that the plane I was to leave on. Maybe his time's been changed, or it's delayed, it's bad weather. And I'm just not one of these that I just wasn't built with wings, and I never cared too much for flying. And I never expect to have wings in eternity either. But I generally go over to a corner of the airport, and I say, Lord, I want to trust you with all my heart. Now, just help me to sit down here and just rest in you. That's when I needed. Trust in Jehovah with all thy heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. And I go to the window and I look at the weather, you know, and I make a prognostication. But he says, don't lean on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He led me here. He led me there. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Now, I never did this before, I must confess, but until I had cancer, I took every day just as it came. There's a tide in the fires of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. That's the way I took life, but I don't take it that way anymore. Every time I come to a new day, I 
always like to go and look up at the sky and say, Lord, thank you for bringing me to a new day. Now, the sun may not be shining, or it may be. And it may be a gloomy day, or it may be a bright day, but whatever day, I thank him now. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. It took me a long time, friends, to find out what that meant in life. And you remember the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. That's an amazing thing. If you have committed yourself to God and you're going down a certain path, doing a certain thing, it's amazing how everything else drops into place. Your whole body is full of light. Your whole life is full of light at that time. Let me move on. This is a rich book, is it not? He says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear Jehovah and depart from evil. It shall be healing to thy sinew and moistening to thy bone. You know, I think that actually it's good help to trust in the Lord. It's wonderful to rest in him and not in yourself. And we're told today, let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Get you away from sin. Get you away from these things that corrode not only your spiritual life, but actually your physical life. He says now, honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, this is total commitment. Remember that God told Israel when he put them in the land, He says, the land is mine, I'm giving it to you. Now, they were to bring a tenth. I think they actually gave three tithes to the Lord. One went to the temple, but one they brought at the very beginning when they had a crop. You know what they brought that for? Just to acknowledge that God was the owner of it. And that is an evidence of total commitment. Now, don't tell me you're totally committed until your pocketbook is committed to the Lord, too. Because he gave you everything. I don't care who you are. If somebody says, I worked hard and got this, who gave you health to work? Who gave you the work to do? Who made it possible for you to make money? Why, my friend, God did all that for you. And you acknowledge him. That's the evidence of total commitment. Somebody says, this is pretty mercenary preacher you're moving to today. Oh, no, this is spiritual. Real spirituality is not the length of the prayer that you pray, it's the length of the check that you write. That's really the way you tell spirituality. I've always found out when I was pastor that the person who did the most talking did the less giving. It always was true. And the man or the woman who wants to run the church, they sure do not do very much for the treasure. You may be sure of that. God has put it on that kind of basis And that's the way it is. Now he says, my son, despise not the chastening of Jehovah. God's going to chasten you as you go along through life. Neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighted. Now, God never whips the devil's children, but he sure does spank his own. That's a good evidence that you belong to him. You remember in the book of Job, we saw this, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. And by the way, this is not punishing. I would like to, and I wish I had time to dwell on this, we talk today a great deal about punishing criminals, and that's the word. We talk today, we punish our children. Don't you punish your child. Correct him. Punish the criminal. And I'm afraid we got some judges today that have got the thing all mixed up. I know a man, he's a judge. My, how he, his little fella, he took him and slapped him across the room. I think he's wrong. He should have corrected him. That's his own. But he should have punished that criminal. But he let him off. My friend, we got it mixed up today. You punish criminals, you correct your children. How different it is. This is discipline. And this is what God uses for his own today.
Now we're told here, verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom, the man that getteth understanding, and happy is the man that findeth Christ. He's wisdom today. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. Now, here in this book, wisdom has a school, and she's a she, because it's in contrast to the stranger woman. She's more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. God did promise long life in the Old Testament for those that served him. You see, we need to recognize today that the same kind of bravery that is exhibited by man in order to get precious metals and jewels and the wealth of this world, well, we need to go after the Word of God like that. It needs to be like that. And we're told, Jehovah by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. You know, it takes a pretty smart person to run this universe. Only God can do it. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up, and the skies drop down their dew. Now, friends, we have seen this young man in the book of Proverbs. He started out as a little boy in the home where he was told to listen to his father and mother. He moved out into life, and as he did, facing a big world, why, he was instructed above all things to go after wisdom. In fact, he was not only challenged to do it, he was urged to do it. And he was told that it doesn't come easily. It requires study. It requires effort. It requires time. And the Spirit of God is not opening the Word of God to lazy minds. Only those that are alert and want to learn and want to know the will and the Word of God. And one of the, I think, great problems today is the fact that they're not willing to make the sacrifice to study. A great deal of laziness is covered over with a lot of pious jargon, a lot of pious platitudes, and a great many folk learn a nice little vocabulary that sounds good, and it covers up a woeful ignorance of the Word of God. And frankly, these are days when there's no excuse of being ignorant of the Word of God. We should study today, and it will require study. I think there's an American proverb that covers all of this. doesn't sound very grammatical, but here it goes. Nobody don't never get nothing for nothing, nowhere, no time, no how. That's the American version. Now we come here to verse 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. Now, you and I live in a universe that is tremendously orderly. But the world, by wisdom, doesn't know God. Because today, many of the great scientific minds are not Christian. I've been rather amazed at the number of folk who work in the space program that are believers. Many of them listen to our program, and we rejoiced in that, of course, and many of them support our program. But it's strange to me that those who study the laws of nature and probe into the secrets of the universe are not brought to the realization that we live in a universe that just couldn't have happened. And if it did happen, how did it happen, and where did it happen? And where is the chicken that hatched out the egg? You've just got to have that chicken somewhere along the line. And therefore, this orderly universe, so orderly that you can take a rocket, send it out in space, put three men in it, they go to the moon, and they are able to land on the moon and come back. And you say, my man is sure smart. Yes, he's smart, all right. He just found out 
the laws of God and that everything operates just like a computer. (laughs) And my friend, if this was a universe by chance, it would not operate according to a computer. But they put that little computer working and the rocket goes right there and comes back because there's certain laws God has made. God by wisdom made this. And God is, and I do not mean to be irreverent, God is no dummy. You and I need to recognize that God is an intelligent person. And he, I think, would appreciate the fact that if we showed more intelligence, more knowledge of him and his ways. Now, you find out about it in his school, the Word of God. That's the only place. Now, he goes on here, and he speaks of this. Verse 21, "...my son, let them not depart from thine eyes." That is, God's knowledge. "...keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck." You see, life and grace come through this wisdom of actually studying the Word of God. "...then shalt thou walk in thy way safely." and thy foot shall not stumble. It's good for you when you're walking. And then when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. There is today in the heart of man a certain fear, a certain hang-up that he has about life. And these things come to us. And what is the solution? And we spend most of our time either walking or lying down, and therefore we need to recognize that a knowledge of the Word of God is the answer to all of that. How wonderful it is here to find out that the truth of God, it will hold us. It's not that you and I hold the truth, but the truth will hold us. Now, he goes on to say here in verse 25, "...be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the lawless when it cometh." Now, this is a verse that has meant a great deal to me. I have a hang-up on flying. I don't enjoy it. Very candidly, I sit there waiting for the plane to fall. You want to know the truth? I think, well, in the next minute, this is it. But this is a verse that has been of great encouragement and help to me. I take it with me when I go by plane, and I go by plane a great deal. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Don't be afraid of that next minute. God's taken care of the one year in. He'll take care of the next one. Neither of the desolation of the lawless when it cometh. For Jehovah shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. It's a time like that that you need to trust God. And that's when I really talk to him. I say to him, Lord, this morning when I was in bed before I got up, I didn't really need you as much then as I do right now. Here I am up 38,000 feet in the air, and I'm just a little frightened. Now I said, this is the test. Give me that confidence and give me that assurance that you're going to keep my foot from falling. In fact, you don't worry up there about stumping your toe. You worry about other things. But it all amounts to the same thing. Now, will you notice, he goes on and says here, this is a marvelous, marvelous proverb that we're coming to here. In fact, several of them. Withhold not good from its owners when it is in the power of thy hand to do it. There was a man, and the man was my dad. I have no reason to believe my dad was a Christian. He didn't like the organized church. He was opposed to it, and I'm sure very bitter about it. But I always felt he was rightly related to God personally in his life. And one of the reasons is, my dad, we'd be, this is a long time ago, we'd be riding down in West Texas, in a buggy down a country road. Well, a gate had come open, and a man's cows had gotten out. My dad would stop and drive the cows back in and shut the gate, 
old wire gate. I can see him now as he had pulled that gate to and put that wire over the top. And he'd get back in the buggy. He'd not say anything to anybody. And he never mentioned it to the man what he'd done. It was things like that in his life that made me believe that he knew God probably a little better than some of the saints that I meet today. Withhold not good from its owners when it's in the power of thy hand to do it. And then notice this, say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. (laughs) Oh, how many people today say, Well, now, I'm going to support your program. You can count on me. (laughs) But I have to wait until something comes in, my ship comes in. Well, my friend, they got a bank account right there and then. They could have written a check for the radio program. Now, I use that as an illustration because it's pretty vital and very close to me. But very candidly, friends, how many people do that They use that type of an excuse in all relations of life. They say, now, I can't help you right now. You come back tomorrow. And they could have done it right there and then. And we're told, oh, no man ought but love. That is something about the child of God that ought to reveal him. You know, when you and I owe money to another person, that money we have is not ours. It belongs to the other man. And to use it for our own purposes actually is dishonest. And that's the thing that he's saying here. And verse 29, "...devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth confidently by thee." You've got a good neighbor. And don't do things that would be to your advantage, but to his disadvantage. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses by undermining the Joneses. That is what he's saying here. And it's to abuse a confidence. How wonderful it is to have a neighbor. And you say, would you sort of keep an eye on my place? I'm going to be gone a few days. And you get back and you find out that he did quite a few things. Well, he doesn't say anything about it. These are practical things. And friends, it reveals a man's relationship to God. Because these are things that God is saying to us today. Be very practical. Now he says, Strive not with a man without cause, if he hath done thee no harm. We are told to resist not evil. Now, under the law, it was a sin to strive with another without adequate ground. But under grace, God says to us, Avenge not yourself. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. We leave the pathway of faith and trust in God when you and I take matters in our own hands. I think that we've been done unjustly. Turn the individual over to God and let God deal with him. I have found out over a period of many years as a minister that if someone does you harm, you can hit back. But go to God. Let him know that you've been hurt. and Tell him about it and turn them over to God. And tell the Lord, this is your business. You said you'd take care of it. You know, and I've watched over a period of years, God deals with folk like that. These are wonderful proverbs. They're helpful not only for young men, but old men too. And women and girls, in fact, the human race. And then verse 31, "...envy thou not the violent man, and choose none of his ways." For the froward is abomination to Jehovah, but his secret is with the righteous. Now, there are certain people that are actually an abomination to the Lord. And the fact of the matter is, you're going to find out a little later some of the things God hates. And he mentions them here in Proverbs. We'll be getting to that. Now, he says here, the curse of Jehovah is in the house of the lawless, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Now, there's something I haven't been following along very carefully here. Remember, I said at the beginning, you'll find a proverb for every character in the Bible. And most of your friends, I think you'll have a proverb for them. Now, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. That's Ahab. I tell you, God certainly judged that house. And this is the proverb that would fit him just like a glove. 
Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Now, God seems to hate the scorner, the arrogant, the conceited. And then we're told here, "...the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools." There are quite a few that that fits, and maybe you know somebody. But we're not going to get personal here today. Now, we find that there were many in that day that envied the rich. And then they found out, old Asaph did, that God judged the rich. Now, that brings us to the end of that chapter, and I want to move now into chapter 4. And we find here, again, he says, "...hear ye children." And that includes, I think, all of the children, young and old, male and female. "...hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law." For I was my father's son. Now, Solomon wrote this. He's talking about his own father. And notice, I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Now, there are those that feel like that what you have here, that the father's heart was wrapped up in this boy Solomon. I don't see it like that. I think the historical books that tell us the life of David and Solomon reveal that Solomon was not the choice, the first choice of his father. And Solomon was not the one that I'm confident that David would have chosen. I don't think that this boy brought up in the women's palace and brought up as more or less of a sissy. I've always felt Solomon was that type of a man, and he was a playboy. And David didn't have too much in common with him, but David gave him advice, and he may not have given it to him in a way that the boy would accept it. But he says, I'm a father's son, but it was tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. It was my mother that really loved me and taught me. And he says, he taught me also. I think David gave him a great deal of advice. And you remember when he was made king, David said to him, play the man. I don't think David felt he would play the man. But he taught him, and he said unto me, let thy heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live. He said, I have learned by experience that you better obey the Lord. And I think that probably David was not as kind in teaching this son as he probably could have been. As we've said before, I've never felt David was a success as a father. And that's been true of a great many men. But the unfortunate thing that the life of David was something that he could emulate. Now, I know there are those going to write in and said, yes, but look what David did. He did that before Solomon came along, and he didn't live like that. David turned from that type of a life altogether. Now, let's move along, because he's now giving advice, Solomon is, to a young man. And he's really laying it on the line. Get wisdom, get understanding, and forget it not, neither decline from the sayings of my mouth. Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Now, wisdom here will be depicted as one who keeps a school, as she sent out her catalog. And the other one, the stranger woman, she's bidding for the interest of the young man also. And now wisdom is urging him to come to her school that he might be wise. And now Solomon is saying, Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. And that, I think, is probably the difference today in men at the present time in relation to this matter of education and of knowledge and of learning. Do we love wisdom? Do we love the Word of God? The interesting thing is that human knowledge, as Pascal said, it must be understood to be loved, but divine knowledge must be loved 
to be understood. And so if you're going to understand the Word of God, there are several things you've got to bring to it, and that's a love for the Word of God. And then you bring to it a mind that's willing to be taught that the Spirit of God can open up the great truths to you. How important it is to see that. Listen to the way he speaks of wisdom. Forsake her not. She shall preserve thee. Love her. She shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. It's not just knowledge. It's not just to have a computer mind. We seem to have quite a few of those around. But it's wisdom and intelligence to use knowledge aright and to have a love for it. And that is something that the soul of man needs. The reason that education is not satisfying is because the way it's dished out. The most impressive thing here is that we are therefore to get wisdom, how important this is. And he says, exalt her. She shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thy head a chaplet of grace, a diadem of beauty shall she deliver. The very interesting thing here is that wisdom is like a love for a woman that is to be like that. And now when you come to the New Testament, it's changed. Christ has been made unto us wisdom, and we're to love him. The real difficulty today is not that there are problems in the Bible. The real difficulty today that in man there's not that love and longing for God and for the things of God. When that is there, then this book will begin to open up because the Spirit of God will become the teacher. This is very important that we're in right now, friends. Let's not pass it over lightly. We read here in verse 10, Hear, O my son. It sounds to me like it's Bathsheba talking to Solomon. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy step shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shall not stumble. What a wonderful call it is to this young man now to seek wisdom. And he's told here in verse 13, "...take fast hold of instruction, let her not go." Notice the language there. Take fast hold of instruction. This is something that should have top priority. Be sure and learn all that you can. Let her not go. Keep her, for she's thy life. Enter not into the path of the lawless, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, and pass not by it. Turn from it, and pass away. As we said before, the warning all the way through here is against the evil man and the stranger woman. That woman is a prostitute, of course, and I think we'll see it also has a spiritual application. Now we are told here, verse 16, "...for they sleep not except they've done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of lawlessness and drink the wine of violence." Now here is something that I think God's people need to learn. Do you hear it said sometime, "...I don't see how that man could do a thing like that." I do not see how that woman could live that kind of a life. How can she live with herself? May I say to you that these folk couldn't live with themselves if they didn't do these things. And you and I do not know how desperate and how deep the human heart can go into sin. There is nothing, there is nothing that the human mind and heart will not conceive of. This is something that is tremendous that is given here. We need to learn that in life, that out in this world we're in today, you're not meeting nice people all the time. You have to be very careful of who you meet. There are some people that 
will be very wonderful. One of the greatest experiences I've had was as a pastor. And when I was a pastor in downtown Los Angeles, every day that I went in, I prayed in the car going in. When you ride these freeways here in Southern California, you'll do well to pray. But I prayed about really something else. My prayer always went something like this. Lord, I'm going to meet new people today. Some of those people I can help, and some of those would hurt me. Help me to be able to tell the difference. And the man that needs help, may I put my arm around him, but the man that would put a knife in my back, help me to avoid him. That's very important, I think, that we need to recognize we live in that kind of a world. And I found out that there are certain men that will become wonderful friends, bosom friends. And I thank God for those men. Men like that made this radio possible. And then there have been men that have tried to destroy it. They've actually professed to be Christian. And it's difficult really to understand their thinking. But the human heart is not to be trusted, and we need to be very careful. We need to be able to distinguish the things that differ, and we need to be able to meet mankind and to have a discernment. My, how that's needed. Now let me move on down here to verse 18 of this fourth chapter of Proverbs. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You meet those wonderful folk like that, the wonderful saints of God that you meet today. But in contrast, the way of the lawless is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. Now, there are two ways that are opened up here. And one way is the way the righteous go. It's a shining light and shineth more and more into the perfect day. Now, there's another way, the lawless. Somebody says, this reminds me of the broad way the Lord talked about and the narrow way. And I do not believe that there's anything been as misunderstood as what he said in that connection. The idea today, and I can remember as a boy, they talked about the broad way and the narrow way. And I'll be very frank as a boy. If you'd have said to me, which way would you think would be the best way to go? I would immediately have said, I think you could have more fun on the Broadway. And unfortunately, I think that's the impression that's been given. And I don't think that that's accurate at all. Very frankly, the picture's altogether different. The Broadway, and believe me, it's a wide one today. And that's where the mob is. That's where the crowd is. I tell you that they are having vanity fair down that way all the time. A carnival is going on. And by the way, that word carnival comes from the word carnal, and that has to do with the flesh. Oh, I tell you, down there is that place where you can indulge the flesh. And they call that the way of liberty. My, we hear that we're living in a new age and you are to do as you please. It's a broad way. It certainly is. That is when you enter it. But if you'll notice that this way that opens up, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. It doesn't get wider. The way of the lawless is as dark. It's a dark way. There are lights up at the entrance, but when you get down a little ways, there are no lights, and they don't even know what they're stumbling at. That's the broad way. And it leads, the Lord Jesus, I think, made it clear that the broad way keeps getting narrow and narrow. It's just like going in at the big end of a funnel. And that's the wrong end of a funnel to go in. You go in the big end, and as you go in and start moving through it, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower until finally it's destruction. Now, the narrow way, that's the way that it's very narrow. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way. There are not two or three of them. It's not wide. It's the Lord Jesus. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. The end there are the ways of death. That's the broad way. But there is a way, and that way is 
Christ. And Peter said to his people, There's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The Lord Jesus said, No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, my friend, you can't make it any narrower than that. He says, I am the door, though, by me. If any man enter in, what shall he do? He's going to find pasture and life. You see, it's narrow as you enter, but it gets wider and wider and wider and wider. That's the end of the funnel that we need to go in. That end is labeled the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the picture that is here. And that is what he's saying. And in verse 20, My son, attend unto my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them and healing to all their flesh. And this is the word that the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And the words are life. It was said by one man of another great man of the past that his words were so wonderful that if you'd cut them, they would bleed. Living words, if you please. And that's what the words and the Word of God are. If you cut them, they're going to bleed. They're living words. They bring life to you. And they bring light to you. They bring instruction and direction and joy. All comes through the Word of God. Now, verse 23 is one of the great verses of the book of Proverbs. Keep thy heart above all keeping. That is the one translation that and I've noticed that I every now and then revert to another. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Uh, above all keeping, this is the one thing you're to do, for out of it are the issues of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and it's the heart that pumps that blood. And you remember it wasn't until Harvey, back in the 18th century, he was taking a bath. And that's when he discovered the circulation of the blood. And that revolutionized medical science. And here, in the book of Proverbs, it's just very calmly taken for granted. That which revolutionized medical science. Keep thy heart above all your keeping, for out of it are the issues of life. And the Lord Jesus said, it isn't what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man. And then he said, out of the heart. And the Lord gave the list of the things that come out of the heart. I tell you, some of the meanest things in the world can come out of the human heart. The heart is the seat of the total personality. You want to know how important the heart is? You ought to get a concordance and look up in the Bible the references that there are to the heart. And it was Harvey that made that discovery that the blood circulates. And we're told in that apocryphal book, the Epistle of Barnabas, it tells about a mythical phoenix, a bird that consumes itself by fire and rises in resurrection. May I say to you, that is as phony a statement as it was ever made. But that's not in the Bible. That's in Greek mythology. But here's a statement that's made here, and science has demonstrated it, that it's true. And in the book of Proverbs, friends, they bear no unscientific statement or inaccurate observation. What a wonderful statement this is here. And believe me, out of our heart, and we're to keep our hearts with all diligence. It's important what you hear. It's important what you study. It's important what you see. Because I tell you, this heart that you and I got, it just can't be trusted. And we need to recognize that out of that heart will come all of the great issues of our life. Now he goes on to say, put away from thee a froward mouth, perverse lips, put far from thee. Now, you see, it's the heart that these things come out of. But it's the mouth and the lips that'll do the speaking. 
Somebody has put it like this, that what is in the well of the heart will come up through the bucket of the mouth. And how true that is, because sooner or later, the mouth is going to give you away. The mouth tells where you're from, what section of the country that you're from. And it certainly gives you away. I was riding on the train. And this was a very lovely thing that happened. And I went in for breakfast in the morning. And I was glad to get back to train travel. It was such a thrill to me. And I was just sitting there looking at the scenery. We were going over by Flagstaff, Arizona. And they had had a late spring snow. Oh, it was so pretty. And I was sitting there looking at it. Now, that's the way I wanted to take it. I wouldn't want to be out in it. But just to sit there and look out at it. So lovely, so pretty. And the steward there in charge of the dining room, he leaned down to me. He says, some friends of yours, your students across the way here want to pay for your breakfast. Isn't that a lovely thing to do? And I looked over there and these folk, a lovely couple, were smiling at me. And so I got up and went over and shook hands with them, found out they listened to our radio program, and I began to talk to them. And I noticed another couple back of them were very much interested. And so a little later, they met me in the lounge, and they said to me, You're Dr. McGee? And I said, Yes. Well, they said, We recognize that voice. We listen to you in Peoria, Illinois. And my, you know that we found two or three there. And the thing that gave me away is my mouth. It just told who I am. You can't obscure things like that out of the mouth. And we need to be careful what comes out of the mouth. Miss McGee and I were way up in the northwest, little town. We just went in to sit down and have lunch. And we were talking, and we noticed the waitress was very much interested. And finally, she just butted right in. She says, aren't you Dr. McGee? And I said, yes. And I said, how'd you know me? Well, she said, I had never seen you before, but I listened to you on the radio. And my wife said to me afterwards, says, you sure better be careful what you say, because you are recognized sometimes when you don't think you're being recognized. Out of the heart, these things are going to come up through the bucket of the mouth, and the mouth just gives us away who we are, tells all about us. Now, he says, here's something about the eyes. Verse 25, let thine eyes look right on. (laughs) Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. That's one thing the young man in life is to do. Ruin your career. A man told me, he says, as a young man, I ruined my life by having an arrest and I have a record, and he says, you know, that thing confronts me again and again, and it has in this life. How careful a young man needs to be. Now we come to chapter 5, and here in chapter 5, we find it return again to this stranger woman. And this chapter, I think, should be read very carefully by the young man because he's counseled here to live a pure life for the sake of his home. And this is the kind of sex education that God gives. I don't know about you, but I like it a little bit better. Some of the things that I'm hearing today, even in Christian circles, God is saying a pure life should be led for the sake of the home later on. And a lot of the problem in the home didn't begin there. It began way back in the sex life of the individual. Now, will you notice here, listen to him. My son, and here he is talking to the young man again, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine heart to mine understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Now, what he's saying here is, it's wisdom now, bidding this young man to come to her school, that he might learn something. And then he goes on to say here, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Now, the evil man in the last chapter 
Here it is the strange woman. That stranger woman was the one that came in from the outside. She was generally a Gentile. She was a prostitute. And her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on Sheol. Lest thou ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. There was a famous, or probably I should say infamous, gangster in the penitentiary in Atlanta. One of the officers there told me this story about him, that this man had contracted syphilis. And if it's not taken care of, he'll go to the brain called paresis and actually leads to insanity. He said that this man had become, before he died, a blubbering idiot. Then he made this comment to me. He said, you know, he says he was responsible for the ruin of many a girl. He says, you know, it's interesting. They don't get by with it. Some girl along the route got even with him. (laughs) And the warning here is against That type of thing, you see. Her feet go down to death. Steps take hold on Sheol. Lest thou ponder the path of life, her ways are movable. Thou canst not know them. What a warning is given here to this young man. And he says, Hear me now, therefore, O ye sons, and depart not from the sayings of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the entrance of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel ones, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh, thy body are consumed. What a picture of a venereal disease. And that's an epidemic condition here in Southern California. And say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof? Have not hearkened to the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. God says he's not mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap. God says this is the thing that will come to pass. Our society is reaping what has been sown. And today, the gross immorality goes back to the lack of instruction in the Word of God. I sound like a square, don't I? Well, that's what I am. Now he tells about the relationship that should exist between the husband and the wife. And here you see marriage brought to a very high plane And notice the way that it's spoken of here in a very wonderful way. It says, "...drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee." In other words, your offspring should be offspring that your wife, the wife of your bosom, is the mother of. He says, Now let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. Now, the Word of God makes it very clear that physical love and sexual love is to be sanctified and brought to a very high level. There was a time when these things were taboo. They were not mentioned, and they were thought of as being maybe something that was immoral, even among married folk. It's a sort of a dirty thing. Do you notice here God lifts it to the very highest plane? Why? Because marriage is something God's given to the human family for the welfare and weal of mankind. It's something they're trying to get rid of. 
today, of course. Now, for the child of God, for the Christian, the Christian home, that should be a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. And you can't have it any higher or holier than that. And God has said some very interesting things in this connection. And right now, when you hear of so many that break over here, this is something that's alarming in some churches, and it ought to cause the church to get down on its knees before God and find out what's wrong on the inside when again and again This man runs off with another woman, and it happens not once and twice, but it probably is happening many times that folk don't know anything about. Well, there's something radically wrong there. The Word of God is not getting through and not influencing and swaying the lives of those that are there. Listen to what the writer to the Hebrews said in 13.4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. God said this is a wonderful relationship. It's not something to be treated as if it's not a clean thing. Why, it's high and it's holy. But notice the other side of the picture. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. A man came in to me years ago. I was pastor of a church, and I'm not giving any details here because I don't want him identified, or them for that matter. And he announced to me that he was leaving his wife, a very wonderful wife and wonderful son, and he was going to run off with another woman. And they're all church members, let's say. But whether Christian or not, I'm not raising that. And he told me what he was going to do. Well, you can imagine what that young preacher at that time said, and I really laid it on the line to him. And he rose in indignation, and he said, Are you trying to rob me of my salvation? (laughs) I said, Brother, if you've got salvation, I'm not going to try to rob you of it. But I do want to say this to you, and I want you to remember it. If you are not God's child, then you're acting according to the way the devil's children act. But if you happen to be a child of God, I want to say this to you. One of these days, God's going to take you to the woodshed, and he'll whip you in an inch of your life. And I'm not sure but what he'll take your life. And this fellow sneered. (laughs) May I say to you, maybe I'm in the position of saying, I told you so. But be that as ugly as it might be, I have to say this. The years have gone by since then, many years. And those two are the loneliest, saddest, most frustrated, unlovely today. Oh, how I'm confident both of them would like to say, if I could only go back and do it all over again. Oh, will you notice, Peter goes on and says, he says that husband and wife are to dwell together according to knowledge. And notice this tremendous, that their prayers be not hindered. And that's in 1 Peter, the third chapter. Read those first few verses. I'll not turn to them, but how tremendous they are. Let me tell you, this is a real test. When a husband and wife are so living before each other that they have joy and confidence and can kneel together and pray together and love together. And that home represents the relationship of Christ and the church. I want to tell you, my friend, that that is something God can and will bless. Oh, how important this is. Now, will you notice verse 21 here in this fifth chapter? For the ways of man are before the eyes of Jehovah, and he pondereth all his goings. Now, there's an interesting verse. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. You have to recognize that God is seeing you all the time. He's watching you all the time. Man was put in a foursome with 
three of us that were Christians, he didn't know that we were three preachers. And he was glad to get away from us when he found out who we were. But he ripped out an oath. And when he found out that he was with preachers, he began to apologize. He said, oh, I'm sorry for what I said, and all that sort of thing. Well, I'll tell you, I said to him, I said, brother, oh, don't pay attention to us. We're just three men like you are. But you are speaking that way before God all the time. And I don't care whether you're in a bar room, wherever you are, you're saying that before God. The ways of man are before the eyes of Jehovah. And God ponder it. God is wondering why you act and say what you do. I think that's the only time that God really gets puzzled, is the way that some act today. Now, we have here a tremendous picture. I heard a man preaching years ago. He said, I'm a dying man, talking to dying men. That's what we are. I'm a sinner saved by grace, speaking to sinners that if they're not saved by grace, they can be saved by the grace of God. Now notice as he moves on here, he says here that his own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. God says that There is a day coming, a day of accountability, a day of retribution, a payday is coming someday. And that day is on the way, my friend. You think you're getting by with it. You're not getting by with it at all. 